Hello, I'm Dahi O'Kiran, and you're listening to Poetic Synergy, a programme that explores Eastern influences on the work of some Irish poets. Later on, I'll be meeting with a group of panellists who will explore those Eastern influences on this particular poet's work. This week, I'm in the company of Joe Woods. Joe, you're very welcome to the programme. Thank you, Dahi. Joe, it seems to me maybe that you had spent some time in Japan. I was just wondering, before then, was there anything that influenced you as a person or woke in something in your imagination about Japanese or even more Eastern poetry? Well, I, I think um, it was probably the reverse, Dahi, in the sense that I, I didn't really have a great awareness of, of Japan um, at all uh, because, in a sense, I ended up there uh, almost by accident. You know, I've described it uh, in a sense of in the early 90s, leaving Ireland and going to Japan, it was like someone turned the lights on. And it was like, in some respects, arriving on a different planet. Um, Almost everything about Japan seemed to be opposite to the way things were at home. I remember initially being quite taken aback by the, the kind of lack of countryside and the built upness aspect of 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 the country but uh in time uh, i just became you know i became interested in everything from you know literally from the tea ceremony through to the literature through to the poetry one thing i i kind of set myself the task when i was when i arrived in japan i, I set myself the task of only reading work by japanese writers uh, not, not in Japanese, I should say, <laughs> but uh, that that was very useful um, because certainly through reading novels and through reading poetry, it sometimes explained situations that you were actually living on a day to day basis and it explained kind of uh, differences. And were you surprised because you said you were impacted by the lack of countryside, yet all the lights turned on inside you. I wonder what was that like as an experience and as, as a process? Well, it was very, very alienating. And I mean, there's a a really very strong case of getting culture shocked by the place, because I think the typical template for a lot of foreigners arriving in Japan, certainly in those days, was they arrived and they embraced and loved everything. And then in three months or thereabouts, they would have pretty, pretty bad kind of psychological culture shock, whereby you'd wake up one morning and you felt you understood nothing, you know, whatsoever. That could be quite alienating. I was fortunate in that all that time I was looking for work. So by about the third or fourth month after I'd arrived, I'd landed a job. So um, instead of uh, being culture shocked, I was kind of quite elated that I was actually going to stay on at that stage. And when you encountered the opposite of who you were, what you knew and what you thought you were, what was that like? I was teaching. I was teaching English. I tended to work in the evening. That was was a was a form of freedom in itself. But then, because the language that the that's ambient, that's around you, that's on the radio, that's in 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 the newspapers, and if you don't understand it, you're you're liberated to some to some extent, and um, because you're you're living in your own language or you're living in a kind of a cocoon. So at that time, I'd, I I had been writing for a couple of years, but I started looking at things differently i suppose like kind of a, a, you know not to put too big of a word on it a kind of a linguistic isolation that that i was that i was experiencing but in a strange way that uh, lent to being kind of very absorbed in your own language um creatively and imaginatively and i suppose kind of thinking about home in 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 a, in a different way and you used the the image of a cocoon and that you went in and you said that not understanding became liberation. So inside in that cocoon, when you're not understanding, what was happening to you as a person and as a poet? I suppose, um, uh, well, another kind of parallel thing that was happening to me is I was teaching English mm-hmm. uh, uh, and teaching English uh, as a foreign language. And that, to some extent, simplifies, I think, the language and again makes you you question the language. And I wonder, as a teacher of English in Japanese culture, what did you learn about the English language and your use of the English language, teaching it to people from a different perspective who are totally the opposite to you and you're explaining what you've brought with you from Ireland 
and you're presenting it to them and they're reacting to you. I wonder what that was like and how maybe it influenced your work as well. The Japanese had a very quite a limited idea that, you know, if you spoke English, you were by and large, you were American. So uh, and most of the schools would have been American. So suddenly, you know, to have this Irish man come in and start telling them about uh, Ireland, which they'd I, don't, I think almost to a soul nobody had ever heard of. Um, what was was very strange. But teaching English, I think, simplifies English for you in a sense, and it it makes you think about every word. And I think, to some extent, certainly in in my first book of poems, I sometimes think that that's uh, you know that that's there. You know, that's a, that's a sense of of weighing up each word and weighing up each sentence in a, in a very um, precise fashion. Not necessarily in a formal fashion, but in a very in in, in a certain kind of precise way as you're aware like in ireland one of our um how said the narratives that we have or the myths that we have about ourselves as a people is that no matter where we go people say ireland or oh, music and poetry and literature yet you were you were confronted as almost a quasi american <laughs> in your teaching in japan i just wondered when you were wandering the streets and you were wondering about uh, yourself and your, your your work, where in Ireland did you escape to in the imagination? I mean, that's interesting because I, th- I think uh, it's an unusual one because you, I, I think we all have a kind of an idealised Ireland in our head. C- certainly for me, in a bizarre sense, and I'm not from the West of Ireland, but it sometimes seems to be mm. that you escape to the West of Ireland or you, in your head, in an imaginative space, or you escape to places... Um, that were important in childhood and in terms of holidays and, and places like that. And I suppose um, a couple of those places would have been, um, you know, the Midlands, which is where uh, my grandparents were from. And I started I started writing a, 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 about those places and also childhood. You know, there were not not I think childhood in, in uh, I kind of, kind of came to childhood much, much later than that, much more recently. But I think, um, you know, certain kind of seminal things that had happened uh, seemed uh, to be suddenly worth writing about at that distance, whereas confronted with them in the everyday, they might not have been. So now, 20 years later, and this was a journey you went on in your 20s. Now everybody knows your age. (laughs) (laughs) So now 20 years later, what's it like looking back at that journey that you went through from the perspective of middle age and from where you are now as a poet and what maybe did it add to your poetry? Well, that's a good question. It's one I'm probably still trying to figure out uh, in the sense, Dahi. I was fortunate enough about four years ago to go back. I've really been kind of considering that theme, the returns and what they mean in journeys. And I'm not sure if I've actually quite figured that out. But I don't, I think, I, I don't think necessarily... Uh, retracing steps is always necessarily a good thing. I sometimes think, you know, if you've had an experience or if you've travelled, sometimes it's best to leave it that way and not to kind of return all the time. And just speaking of returnings, because we've focused a lot on what it was like for you in Japan, what did you bring home and what influences did you bring home to maybe that you try to influence others with as well as opposed to just yourself? Really, I suppose what I've brought home since I sometimes think that there is some sense of a Japanese aesthetic. You know, if I look out the window of my garden uh, onto my garden, there's uh, bamboo trees and there's maples, you know, on a very, very simple level. Um, certainly when I came back, I became f- much, much more interested in, in Japanese poetry and Japanese literature and in a broader sense, Asian, Asian literature. And that's been uh, that's been a kind of a continuing influence. Um, I also um, edited a book of Japanese um, uh, poetry written when I say Japanese poetry, poems about Japan written by Irish uh, Irish poets. And I've, I suppose to some extent maintained this kind of uh, conversation with Asia, with Japan, and to some extent, you know, reconnecting and tapping, uh, tapping into that pool every so often. That pool is an interesting metaphor to use. And I wonder for you... Tap, I don't think you can tap into a pool, but <laughs> <laughs> that's my mixed metaphor. <laughs> OK, don't worry about that so much. One of the things that comes across in your poems, particularly in the one sailing to Hokkaido, is a sense of loneliness and a sense of isolation. I just wonder, what was... What was the experience of loneliness like for you? Well, I was I was actually going out with somebody at the time, but actually that was a that was a solo journey that I took uh, north um, by 
by ferry up the uh, the coast of of Japan on up to Hokkaido and then when I got to Hokkaido I went up to the to the frozen sea of Okhotsk but it was on the uh, on on that journey that I was at that time I was studying Japanese and there was a sudden kind of moment where you realize obviously when you're when you're learning another language that there are words for different things so it's a kind of a, for me that poem um just came about through the notion of learning a new language but also by being alone on this ship and from a point of view i suppose of perspective i'm not standing at the front of the ship i'm standing at the back of the mm-hmm. ship and i'm you know discerning two um darknesses and in a way, I think that's uh, that for me was a sense of um, considering the past and considering, the, you know, the the unknown, be it uh, Japan, which I hadn't really come to terms with, and 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 I suppose you know one one's own one's own past. So yeah, it is about an aloneness, but at the same time, I suppose the the the, the poem "Sailing to Hokkaido" is also about the palpable heartbeat of the generator at the very end and this sense of just you know carrying on and you know and movement i saw there's hope in the end in the sense that you retouched the pulse of the generator absolutely so you talked about retracing steps and maybe this is a good point where maybe you'd read us a poem yeah i'll read um kyoto koan and this is um this is a poem kind of based on that kind of revisiting of Japan um, about four years ago. The koan is a kind of a, a little an epiphany or the little a line of, of, of wisdom or, the, or usually something that's, that's quite uh, religious. So I just I call this poem Kyoto Koan. Back in Kyoto and in the morning plans to set out north to Arashiyama, my old neighborhood. From there to carry on to the surrounding mountains to Joe Jakuji Temple, which in early autumn affords good views east over Kyoto. Before setting out, I recalled reaching Joe Jakuji 15 years earlier, during that harsh winter and what seemed like another life. The temple laid to rest by snow, steps of powder, pristine emptiness, pagodas competing for whiteness. Vividness of that morning froze me, Necessity of not returning to Joe Jakuji. Not now, not ever. To review Joe's work and synergy within it and the Eastern influences, I'm joined by Kevin McDermott, educator and novelist, the poet Gabriel Rosenstock, and writer Alan Titley. Gentlemen, you're very welcome to the programme. In the interview with Joe and reviewing his work, he talked about a transformation and at the end he talked about an epiphany. I just wonder, had anybody noticed that in the work that Joe uh, has presented for the show today? Yes, in the sense that I think that Joe is a poet. Um, he's a very visual poet. In fact, I would compare a lot of his work to painting, where you're, you're uh, not so much painting in words, but when you read his poetry, uh, a picture forms before your eyes, and that picture is often a kind of epiphany, as the best kind of seeing is. Uh, the poem Triptych, for example, as the name suggests, there are three pictures, one one after the other. But the other thing I, I would say about him is that even though he writes, obviously, a great deal about the East and Eastern cultures in particular Japan and China and India to some extent as well. He's not a, a philosophical poet in the way that we'd say Gabriel Rosenstock is a philosophical poet. Joe's is much more observational in that sense. He, he sees it and then something a little light is lit in his in his sense and in that sense I think it's full of those kind of epiphanies along the way. And it's interesting that you mentioned the word light because Joe said that when he went to Japan it was like all the lights went on. I just wonder could we just explore the light in the pictures that Joe paints for us in his work? You know, there's a there's a poem here called Persimmon, and I remember uh, being in Kyoto over ten years ago, and I was with this um, academic, kind of absent-minded professor, and he had this um, wonderful camera with him, and he started taking photographs, 50, 100, 200, 300, 500 photographs or so, of the famous maple leaves in, in Kyoto. Not the trees or the scenery or, 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 or the buildings or the people or anything, just the leaves themselves. And then later that night, sitting down and watching the whole show again on his computer. Now, for him, each of these images 
was serene. Each had a slight little difference, you know. And when I look at this poem called Persimmon, I'll just quote these lines by Joe. The eye catches a persimmon tree out of leaf, and persimmons more orange for the absence of leaf. I think that's very Japanese. In all the, the Japanese arts, um, not just the literary arts, but also, you know, in their ceramics and so on, there is a kind of a sparse grace that, that they achieve and, you know, an, an avoidance of the lush. And you have this beautifully in, in, in many of the poems by Joe here, I think. And for you, Kevin, I see you nodding when Gabriel says about the sparseness and the avoidance of the lush. What catches you, Rai, in Joe's work? I think in one of the first poems that comes from his time in Japan, First Shelter, you can see, I think, uh, taking shelter from the rain, the tail end of a typhoon among old men sitting cross-legged, listening to the pelt and words merging into a counterpoint I have no ear for. And you can almost see that being in a place where others don't speak your language, you don't speak their language, there's a sense in which he's transformed and it's, the poem is put together almost mm. syllable by syllable, word by word. And you can see the aesthetic forming simply by, by almost coming to terms with language in a new way. It's very carefully put together. It's beautifully done but you can kind of see the transformation is that I'm in a place now where I'm learning the language as if for the first time and I think that really influences the aesthetic and that leads to the kind of spurness that Gabriel is speaking about. When Joe was speaking to us he talked about the ceremony he was particularly taken by the tea ceremony and in some sense ceremony is quite sparse because it's about the process and I just wonder does anybody have any sort of thoughts on that. Yes, you see, there's something about these poems that I also think is Japanese, and that is that Joe isn't intrusive in them. Now, uh, in Japanese culture, <laughs> I don't think that they appreciate intrusiveness. In fact, they appreciate the opposite. They, they appreciate that the ability to stand back, you know. Uh, in fact, their, their great philosopher Dogen talks about, you know, when, when the ego retreats, then all things become suddenly manifest. You know, the thousand things become manifest. So uh, uh, you can see that uh, Japanese influence in these, in these poems as well. And, you know, you, you alluded earlier on when talking to Joe, you alluded to loneliness. Now, I would say that if we're looking for comparisons between the Irish experience and the Japanese experience, I would say if you look at early Irish nature lyrics, those winter lyrics about uh, the deer bellowing and the snows and so on. And uh, and when you look at uh, early early forms of Japanese poetry that are still practiced, of course, today, inside Japan and outside of Japan, I'm talking about you know, Tanka and Waka and so on, you find an intense loneliness, which is actually a very poetic and delicious loneliness as well. And they're all at it, emperors, geisha girls... Uh, you know, housewives, they're all, they're all in, indulging, if you like, in this loneliness. And in one of these um, poems by Joe it, uh, called Kyoto Revisited, A Guzzle Diary, the, the last two lines are, are absolutely exquisite. He says, An old lady, stiff with a walking stick, struggles to pick up red maple leaves, something she did as a girl. Now, you know, you, you find in, in Chinese poetry and in Japanese poetry, you find this wistfulness and this sort of... Uh, maybe idealising some past, you know, in some distant place or in some distant time when things were, were, were more golden, were, more, were, were rosier and uh, are more youthful. And uh, that's a beautiful and genuine note to strike here, I think. Yeah, I, I think it's permeated all of his poetry, even the poetry that has not got to do with Japan. Now, I don't know whether Joe was like this or not before he, before he went to Japan, but the Japanese, those of us who have, uh, as in my case, spent a fortnight in Japan once upon a time, so I can't speak entirely authoritatively about it. I was incidentally known as Professor Tittery while I was there, and <laughs> after I gave a lecture, I was told they were going to give me a big crap, but that was just, that's beside the point. I think what it has done is helped him to see things. He has a poem about Clan Brassel Street, and it's a Japanese poem. It's a poem about Dublin, but he talks about over the canal where the mitred swans graze underwater and beyond amid all the asphalt a cherry blossom is beginning to leap over a wall. I'm not sure you could have done that unless you knew something about Japan. And of course his, poet, his poems on Kyoto and on Kobe and elsewhere, um, again that, that sense of the snow when the snow comes, I turned to see snows had arrived and Kyoto was below in its dip, surrounded 
surrounded by mountains gone white overnight. He sees the whiteness and I think he sees it in a way he would never seen it before. So he helps us to see and, the poor, and Gabriel was talking about early Irish lyrics, the blackbird of Loch Lane and so on. And you hear the blackbird, uh, blackbird again because of the poem that you have just read and you see, if you've never been to these places, you see that, that place that, that you see the snow in a different way. You hear things in a different way and you know, it, it's, it increases our awareness. That's what poetry is supposed to do and it works perfectly. And we've, we've been exploring loneliness and one of his poems is called Ice and he refers to Paddy Kavanagh and he talks about the stagnant canal and I just wonder in Joe's journey as a poet was it a necessary thing to do is to be confronted by the stagnant canal and then to have to go into the cocoon of loneliness to actually to see the picture more clearly. Funny when the reference to, to Kavanagh uh, the point of the journey is almost yeah, to turn around and come back. And I think you see that in something like Walls and Islands and Wells, where he's just come back from the east and he goes out to Connemara and he's, he's out west. And suddenly when he looks at Connemara, he goes to Omi Island then. And you see Omi Island through a Japanese eyes. It's almost as if the holy well there is like a Shinto shrine. And he, he ends with an image of an imperial shell. And I think sometimes what the journey east does is that it helps you to look west and to see it more clearly and it kind of defamiliarizes the familiar and you look at it with Japanese <coughs> eyes um, but I don't I don't really think that the uh, there's a sense of stagnation there although the, the reference to it I think there's something really revitalizing by the journey east uh, in the same way that in the poem about uh, standing on the the back of the ship looking and he sees the darkness. It seems to me that that almost stands for the way the poetry works with Joe, is that uh, he looks back on things which have happened and he makes sense of them, and he puts a different word on them. He tells us that in Japanese there's two words for horizon, and you bring that sensibility back to Ireland, if you like. What I like about these poems as well is that the Japanese influence on them is subtle, and it's refined. In other words, it's not it's not a pastiche. Like it would be, it would be so easy in a way to write <coughs> poems in a, a deliberate Japanese style, mm-hmm. and it doesn't always work. It's it it doesn't always really sound sound genuine. But if you look at a poem here called um, Bamboo, <laughs> uh, I'd like to read this for me. It's a short poem. I read it in its entirety. The bamboo wind chimes you brought back and hung high in the yard, bleached in their first foreign winter, rang hollow in the months that followed. Two winters on, the bamboo wind chimes, their ends split, have changed their tune to the tombe of bones. Now that is that is very nice, a very original poem, uh, full of Japanese flavour, but without being a Zen pastiche, let mm-hmm. us say. But it has it has Zen in it. Zen, if we can demystify Zen a bit, and what and what is Zen poetry? Zen is is kind of the the isness of things, and the subtle difference between the isness one moment and the next. And I just yeah. wonder about that isness because in the poem where he's on the back of the ship looking at two words for for darkness, it's like there's a crack of light, and in the bamboo poem there's a crack or a split at the ends. Does he capture something about the essence of change and the essence of being through the process of change? I that? think so. I think so, and I think it's it's actually huge. I think that these little fissures, these little tiny cracks in time and in space, are are. are of an immensity, they're uni- they're huge, you know, and they needn't be exaggerated at all. The, these 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 the tiny things are, are immense. Yeah. You know? it, it's more than than cracks actually. It, it's linking things together, and I think he's very good at that. And how to say you're reading a poem about one thing, and Kevin was talking about walls, islands, and wells, which was, and I took it the wall was the wall of China, but maybe it wasn't. And then you said he goes to Connemara, and there's a reflection of the imperial wall in the seashells on the shore after that so he's linking them all, all together and he, he's, he's a great poem I think it's a brilliant opening of a poem uh, Luis Piedra Buena Patagonia and it starts off with 
Luis Piedro Buena, which is a village, obviously, Luis Piedro Buena had something of Kinnegad or at Lone about. <laughs> <laughs> I just burst out laughing. And as he says at the end, the legend, little to detain you here. So, and I mean, there is humour through the, through yes, the poetry yeah. as well. But those kind of linking, because in the Sicilian sketches, we were also referring to the poem about ice, where he starts off talking about ice. He goes on to about looking out at the frontier face of the frozen sea of Okotsk. And then he comes back to his mother's father, the first time he saw the sea. And we often think, you know, there are people out there who have never seen the sea. I remember teaching uh, teaching children in, in Nigeria. They never saw the sea and I had difficulty explaining to them. There's a great, uh, there's an Irish autobiography, Shkiel Mavaha by Donald Bono Kelecher, and he didn't see the sea until he was an old man. First time he saw the sea, his reaction was like this in Joe's poem, such a lot of water, an awful lot of water, because people never thought that. So he links all kinds of things along the way and he does that, he, he does it very well. And we talked about that there was so much water, uh, the, the reference from his uncle. Is one of the the things that Joe brings to the poetry based on his travel and in his experience is that he can actually distill the water into a purity and into, a, a, I would say, an envisioning of the world in its most simplest way? What I found very interesting uh, in the conversation with Joe mm-hmm. was that here he was in... A land where he was, where he was teaching English, and because he was teaching English, he became, I think, more conscious of of the language and of the weight of each word and each sentence and each phrase. And uh, he, he, I suppose, he brings this uh, ability to communicate to to the poetry itself, and the poetry really communicates very, very well. I mean. I'm afraid not all of modern poetry really is communicative or communicates as well as this. A lot of people out there are confused by what they read in, 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 when, when, when they read a lot of modern poetry. But this communicates. And the poem he read himself there, the Kyoto Koan, I mean, a koan is also a sort of a riddle, you know. It's a riddle that a, a master monk would give to a disciple to empty the mind, as it were, never-ending chit-chat and of its never-ending uh, logical progression and uh, into what is meaning. He just says here, the temple lay to rest by snow, steps of powder, pristine emptiness, pagodas competing for whiteness. That is actually a koan, because that, I think, can fill the mind with this sort of whiteness and allow thought uh, and the agitation which is thought and the dictatorship of thought to subside. The journey to Japan makes him realise is that sometimes you don't always have the language and so you have to simplify and sometimes things get lost in translation. And I think that makes him a very careful poet, but as I say, not a po-faced poet. Um, and I think he really appreciates the moments when he sees things clearly because sometimes it doesn't happen. He says in... Uh, the Kyoto poem, I look in the postbox for the miracle of a dead letter, but find only bills. And so he's aware that sometimes you don't always achieve the epiphany that you set out for. But then you get one in the New Year's Day in Nagasaki, and it comes in an unexpected way. You're in Japan, and maybe you've been looking for the Japanese epiphany, but you find a church, and it's in that church, and you like Someone he watches the person he's with lighting a candle and he says, in this light, the light on you, you move to give worship a meaning. And suddenly it's in the familiar places and the familiar surrounds that he finds meaning. He's a hugely respectful poet. He respects what he's seen. He respects the landscape. He respects Japan. And there's a sense of gratitude for having been there, for having seen it and for what it has given to him and then for what has he, he has been giving to us as well. I think that's a lovely way to end today's programme. Thank you so much, Alan, Gabriel and Kevin. This series has been kindly funded through the Sound and Vision Scheme, which is a funding scheme from the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. <laughs>